Welcome to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the human beings behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring future creators, and for all those that like really great stories, I'm Ira Pastor, I'm your health, aging, and longevity ambassador along for this journey. Today we are going to move into a fascinating area of biology that has a range of potential applications across domains of human health and human enhancement, and that's the area of hibernation biology. Uh, so hibernation is, is generally defined as a, a state of inactivity and metabolic depression in endotherms, uh, which is defined as warm-blooded animals capable of internally generating their own heat. Uh, it commonly occurs during the winter months. It's often associated with low temperatures and functions to conserve energy when sufficient food is available. Uh, it can last days, weeks, or months, depending on the species, uh, the ambient temperature, time of the year, and the individual body condition. And hibernating animals such as Arctic ground squirrels and black bears, they undergo really unique changes in their metabolism. And these changes allow for these animals to survive really long periods of reduced activity and body temperature with no health problems. Uh, fascinatingly, during hibernation, the brain temperatures of organisms like the Arctic ground squirrel drop to just above freezing. Uh, core body temperatures reach below freezing, uh, heart rates drop to one beat per minute, and peripheral colonic and blood temperatures become sub-zero, uh, yet they don't develop ice crystals, uh, allowing their body fluids to remain liquid while in the supercooled state. Uh, and clearly the implications of this research are, are many. Uh, understanding the different metabolic adaptations of hibernation can reveal unique ways to uh, treat health problems that range from atrophy in uh, unused and aging muscles, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disorders. Uh, additionally, the ability of humans to learn from the neuroprotective skills of these organisms will one day uh, be able to pseudo hibernate, could be useful for saving the lives of the seriously ill following strokes, brain traumas, and other forms of catastrophic injury. And needless to say, uh, this ability not to form ice crystals could lead to much better methods of human organ preservation for transplants. So to go further into this area, I'm very happy and honored to say that we're joined by Dr. Kelly Drew uh, from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, the Institute of Arctic Biology at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, Dr. Drew holds a BS in psychology from the University of Alaska. She has a PhD in neuropharmacology from Albany Medical College, and she was a postdoc fellow in neuropharmacology at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Uh, her lab focused on three unique aspects of hibernation biology. The first involves studying the mechanisms of neuroprotection in species like the Arctic ground uh, squirrel uh, and the brain in the hibernating and in the euthermic or the normally warm state. Uh, secondly, she studied the mechanisms and the cognitive significance of the synaptic remodeling that occurs in these species uh, during hibernation, torpor, and inactivity, and then arousal. And thirdly, she studies the central nervous system regulation of the metabolic suppression that goes on during hibernation. Uh, Dr. Drew has been the driving force behind a, a new five-year, $12 million NIH grant to help University of Alaska scientists translate this knowledge uh, from hibernating animals into treatments that can advance human health. Uh, she has been the recipient of many awards throughout her career, including uh, the University of Alaska Dennis Demet Award, supporting Native and rural students, the uh, Amelia Sabelli Distinguished Teaching Award for ability to recognize scientific aptitude in underrepresented students, uh, NIH Sydney McNary Mentoring Award, and she was nominated for the NSA that Presidential Mentoring Award. Uh, Dr. Drew grew up in Fairbanks, is an Alaskan, and she's very focused on putting Alaska on the, the innovation map, uh, which contributes to global advances in biomedical research. Uh, all that being said, Dr. Drew, thank you for taking the time. I know you're on vacation now, but we're coming on the show. Thank you, Ira. I'm really excited to talk about this, and I appreciate the, the nice introduction. Definitely, definitely. So um, to start off, we, we typically give our guests the floor for a while just to talk about you, uh, if, you know, so the audience can learn more about you know, where you've been, what you've been doing, from your background, where you grew up, how you got interested in health, how you got interested in pharmacology, and then ultimately you know, how, how you arrived at this really fascinating area of, uh, of biology in terms of studying hibernation. Well, it's kind of crazy how it all came together. I was, um, I, I moved to Alaska with my family uh, when I was just in high school and ended up staying there for a while before I well, actually um, graduated from college there and went away for training. My interest was really in the brain from an early age and I was fascinated by aspects uh, of consciousness. Um, 
And, and this led me into neuropharmacology, where I received just a very basic um, standard uh, biomedical training and uh, how drugs work and drug development uh, in terms of uh, you know therapeutics and the pharmaceutical industry and then I went back to Alaska in 1990 and that is where I was first introduced to hibernation and I learned about hibernation when uh, one of my um, uh, supervisors uh, handed me a hibernating Arctic ground squirrel and just about anybody who has that experience is uh, is taken by this remarkable state of consciousness, really, that uh, we can't appreciate until we actually see it firsthand. And I think um, we really enjoy taking the animals out for outreach events to elementary schools and passing around hibernating ground squirrels and the kids can handle them and hold them. And, and they're furry, you know, cute little creatures curled up in a ball. Um, until they start to wake up and warm up and then we have to put them away. But it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, and so I was um, completely smitten by the phenomenon and I was amazed by how the brain continues to function at the cold temperatures. It, it, it turns out that temperature has a big role uh, in regulating what's happening in these animals. And with the cold temperature, they have an isoelectric EEG they look like they're dead um, mm -hmm. or at least comatose, uh, but they actually can still respond to the environment. Um, environmental cues can initiate them to rewarm and come out of hibernation. Uh, and so I was just forever uh, amazed at these animals. Um, so when I first got interested and started doing work in them, we were, were really addressing how neurotransmission could work. Uh, at such cold temperatures where there are no action potentials. And so that led us into um, the kind of the neural signal, signaling role of metabolism is something that we are interested still to this day and my lab is involved with. Uh, and along the way, um, I was introduced to the idea that hibernation was a model of tolerance to ischemia or stroke-like conditions. Mm -hmm. So after stroke and even after cardiac arrest, people don't appreciate that um, people die because of brain injury. Uh, so it's that lack of blood flow to the brain that, um, that is difficult to survive. Mm -hmm. And these ground squirrels, when they hibernate, have extremely low blood flow to stroke-like levels. Um, and yet they rewarm without any injury. And so we started to um, understand that. And we found um, that the species in general is just very tolerant to these kinds of things. But in the long run, really the most remarkable neuroprotective aspect of the, of the, of the species was the, uh, was the cold tissue temperature when they are hibernating. And that's already been described clinically. So they routinely, standard of care is to cool individuals after cardiac arrest. Um, and so that's how we moved into that application. And Along the way, we got lucky and we actually um, discovered a really important mechanism that drives that, that decrease in body temperature. And so now we're at an exciting point of being able to develop that to um, apply for neurocritical care mm -hmm. for cardiac arrest initially and hopefully for stroke, uh, spinal cord injury. Um, and uh, it's just exciting to see it all come together. And still, you know, as we discuss this mechanism that induces hibernation, uh, it's, it's really just, you know, so to speak, the tip of the iceberg. Sure. Um, I mean, it really, it, it addresses one important aspect of how they turn down their heater so they get cold, mm -hmm. but there's many other interesting uh, phenomena that create the, you know, the coordinated physiology of, of hibernation. And that's mm -hmm. still, there's a lot to learn about that. But it's fun, and so now we have this opportunity um, with further funding, and I hope, I hope that we can make some more inroads. Continuing al along that that path, then, so um, and, and and I'm going to ask you to define a few words here, if you would, but um, or go a little bit more into it. So we have this term uh, thermolysis or, th or thermolytic effect. Thermolytic, yeah. The thermolytic effects or the dissipation of heat from the body. And, you know, it, it, on past shows, we've, you know, we, we, we talked about, um, uh, some other, I guess, related, not, uh, we talked about tardigrades at one point, which do things a lot differently. You know, they dehydrate themselves and they go into this 
water free state or whatever. In these cases, we're talking about you know this this uh, substantial lowering of heat and everything as you were saying, looking like death, but really slowing down quite a bit. And you've been very active um, in, in, in studying and publishing about uh, adenosine one receptors and, and I guess looking at different agonists and antagonists. Can you, can you sort of walk through a little bit of that? Uh, obviously, interested in the pharmacology uh, at a level and just how sort of you got to that target and, and some of the fascinating things you see when you, when you study, I guess, different agents uh, that either agonize or antagonize those receptors? The, the concept of we, what we call thermolytic is famil familiar at, um, currently with regard to, um, you know, drugs that you take if you have a fever, mm -hmm. you know, like aspirin and um, acetaminophen, mm -hmm. Tylenol. Uh, and, um, but really it hasn't been, this area has not been developed to uh, decrease your Turn down the thermostat, really. You know, you just turn down the temperature that where the heater kicks in, um, and and so we're extending that concept of thermolytic into decreasing um, your normal body temperature that mm -hmm. we in Alaska can appreciate in the winter time if you're if you're tight on money and you and your oil tank is running low. What you do is you turn down the thermostat, you put on a couple of extra sweaters. Mm -hmm. um, and so turning down the thermostat saves energy immediately. Um, and if it's cold outside or you know you don't have very good insulation, um, the temperature will decrease. And so that's really what's happening in the ground squirrels. And I think probably globally with hibernation is they save energy by turning down that thermostat. And and so the what we have discovered is this adenosine A1 receptor in the brain is responsible for that uh, action, and adenosine is so interesting because it's also known to be the uh, mediator of what we call homeostatic sleep drive. Hmm. So there's basically two things that cause us to sleep, at least at, in the in the textbooks right now, hmm. uh, and that would be um, our circadian clock that kind of tells us when to be paying attention and when to sort of calm down. Mm -hmm. But also it's this thing called homeostatic sleep. And homeostatic sleep, for the most part, is this sort of accumulation of adenosine in the brain, almost like a bath application of adenosine. Okay. And that adds that causes us to be sleepy. And they they found this first in cats. Cats like to nap a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they measured this uh, pool of adenosine in the brains of cats. And if they played with them and prevented them from napping, the adenosine would accumulate. And as soon as they would allow them to have their nap, the adenosine would go down. And we're familiar with uh, actions of adenosine because we drink coffee. If we drink caffeine or even tea with theophylline in it, we block those adenosine receptors and that wakes us up. Hmm. And it's particularly effective if we're sleep deprived. So with sleep deprivation, adenosine accumulates and it makes us sleepy. And it's interesting because sleep um, has has an energy homeostatic, you know, role, mm -hmm. but nobody has, it's still not fully understood. Um, but in hibernation, this homeostatic sleep seems to spill over into our um, thermostat area. Okay. And so not only does it make it make us sleepy, but it makes us sleep. And then during sleep, it also, um, there's a, there's a concomitant decrease of thermostat. So the thermostat gets turned down. So animals have to sleep to go into hibernation. And as they sleep, the thermostat is decreased and they transition into this hibernation or also called torpor. Mm -hmm. Torpor is another word. Long-term torpor is what we call hibernation. But so what happens is they sleep and thermostat is set um, lower. And so sleep transitions into decreasing in body temperature and that decreased body temperature has sort of a feedback mechanism to further slow things down. Mm -hmm. And it just progresses until they get to the point where the thermostat says, okay, too cold, now we're gonna start generating some heat. And they cannot get colder than that, but really is just like turning down the thermostat. Mm. And, the, and the ground squirrels turn their thermostat down to about zero centigrade about zero to plus two centigrade. So it's not that they turn it off completely, they just mm -hmm. turn it down. 
And we think that is all through just kind of increased bath application of adenosine with some, some other, um, you know, things in their brain that makes them very sensitive to adenosine in the winter season. Hmm. Aside from your interest in this, you know, you started out with a, a significant interest in, in the brain and consciousness. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things when you, once again, when you go into the literature and, and you look at, at some of the stuff out there on the, um, the Arctic ground squirrel, you find these papers where it just talks about this, this bizarre, and obviously you see it all the time, but this, the fact that the morphology, there's substantial changes during this period of time when they're hibernating in terms of the nerves and the pruning and so forth. I'm talking outside of my, my sphere here, but yet when you arouse these creatures, they remember everything pretty well. You know, they, they're not for loss, even though my understanding is what I see that the brain really changes a lot during those several months. Are you studying a little bit about this? I mean, obviously, this is a whole other sort of complex domain of, you know, what happens up there in between <laughs> the earth. But uh, any fascinating discoveries on that front as far as how they maintain memory and, well, and, and so forth? My kind of probably oversimplified uh, interpretation is that temperature is really what, what I think of as a, as a physiologic effector. So temperature is really the thing having the influence. And uh, so as, um, as they decrease temperature, temperature um, initiates um, changes in proteins and signaling mm -hmm. pathways that um, causes the spines where learning occurs to retract. Mm -hmm. And um, so whether it's just a consequence of temperature or whether it contributes to the energy savings, it's probably both. Um, and so all these processes retract and uh, um, and so during that time, which is a little bit similar to what happens during sleep, mm -hmm. is just ex exacerbated. It's enhanced with a further decrease in temperature. Um, and so uh, that kind of um, you know reduces a lot of the noise that the brain experiences during normal waking. And some of the more critical synapses can remain active, and that can facilitate enhanced consolidation of memories. But, um, but for the most part, it's just sort of a regression into a state of dormancy. Okay. And, then, uh, and then with rewarming, remarkably, all these processes sprout back, and they mm -hmm. come back into place. And so the impact on learning and memory might depend on how long they stay cold mm -hmm. and what we have found is that um, when they come back up out of hibernation uh, within 24 hours of that they actually learn better than animals that have been awake for some time wow. and so we we think it's um so they learn new tasks better and so we think that it's just like waking up in the morning and you know, you're kind of refreshed and you don't have all that noise going on. But it's, it's really much more complicated than that. But other people think that um, one of the reasons that animals need to wake up from this cold uh, state um, is uh, to reestablish those synapses. Mm -hmm. So if they were to stay cold for too long and they came back up, they wouldn't be able to get them back. And they, they wouldn't be able to remember things or learn new things. Um, some memories are lost over the season of hibernation, uh, but not all memories. Mm -hmm. And so there is some regulated, um, you know, coordination of which synapses stay and which, which go away. But uh, it's, um, it's definitely a time of significant uh, plasticity. Mm -hmm. And I think that understanding the effects of cooling and rewarming on this plasticity of uh, both synapses and also even neurons mm -hmm. is really an area of that needs further work. Sure. We really have not done very much with that in terms of function or mechanism. But it's, uh, it's again, I think it's temperature dependent. I think temperature is really what's causing the effect. Mm. The property of uh, not forming ice crystals, obviously that's a, a major uh, issue in, in the whole area of uh, you know, cryobiology and, and, and maintaining organs for longer periods of time for transplant and so forth. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of what you're, you're discovering there, where 
with that whole part of the the program is focused. Um, another really so obviously kind of a, a huge market. <laughs> yeah, that's a wide open area, yeah. and it it really hasn't been investigated um, thoroughly in in the ground squirrels who to my knowledge are the only mammal known to go below freezing and not um, not freeze up. A lot of the work on kind of freeze tolerance uh, or freeze resistance is done in insects. Mm -hmm. So insects uh, uh, are easier to study and a lot of it has to do with redistribution of sugars, glucose, um, and some modulation of uh, membrane excitability to maintain um, you know, uh, you know, prevent the cells from dying, mm -hmm. but uh, there really has not been follow up in the ground squirrel uh, since uh, that initial discovery that they can super cool. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I'm familiar with is that uh, they seem to lack a nucleating factor where ice crystals can form. Okay. And that is uh, what prevents their whole body from freezing up when they super cool. But uh, what that nuclei, you know, how how those nucleating factors are. Um, uh, gotten rid of is is not really well known and and you would think that more has been done there but but we we really haven't um, there's so many interesting aspects of hibernation Absolutely. another thing that we're working on right now is um, how they can uh, stay hibernating for eight to nine months with really no uh, muscle activity and no muscle loading and yet they don't lose any of their um, their muscle strength Hmm. So in a human, even that, you know, has a broken leg for, in, and it's in a cast for a couple of months, when you get that cast off, the leg is all shriveled up and your muscles have degenerated. Uh, it's a problem with, uh, with humans if they try to lose weight, especially okay. older humans, when they stop eating as much protein, their, their muscles will tend to degenerate. Um, and the ground squirrels, as well as hibernating bears are really um, remarkable that they can maintain their muscle strength and um, mass as well as their bone mass and uh, strength without um, during long-term periods of disuse so that's something else that we're looking at right now um, but the whole thing about cold tolerance is also very interesting and the, you know freeze tolerance is very interesting yeah absolutely absolutely there's so many things about hibernation that could uh, be expanded on and be if better understood, I think has just uh, remarkable applications. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that, that leads me into, uh, into my next question. Um, obviously, you know, you've been instrumental in, uh, in developing everything at the university and with this new grant. Can you take us forward to in the next five, 10 years? What are, what are the next big plans in terms of uh, its development of, of some of these uh, therapeutic products, but then also sort of, uh, you know, obviously we, we sometimes talk about some science fiction-y stuff on here, but, uh, uh, you know, we we'll have people asking about suspended animation, cryonics, you know, how these technologies potentially could be useful for sending people up there to, to Mars and so forth. Can you give us sort of the, <laughs> the, the, the 10 years and then sort of the, the 30, 40 year vision as well? Because clearly this, this technology is, goes yeah. everywhere. I think that really is the challenge is to stay grounded mm -hmm. because it's, it's really fun to imagine and uh you know kind of go beyond what what might be uh practical and right. what might be um kind of limited to our understanding of mechanism at this point mm -hmm. but um that's what we're we're trying to uh go somewhat slowly and you know step by step to understand how they work and then the the idea is that we can as we do understand better about mechanism and how to Kind of mimic those, those uh, really detailed mechanisms in non-hibernating animals. That's where we hope that new therapeutics will emerge. Okay. So I have I'm I'm working on what we have learned about adenosine for neurocritical care. We're mm -hmm. trying to move these um, drugs uh, into the clinic, and uh, there's lots of challenges uh, with adenosine that has been around forever with cardiovascular side effects, and so. Uh, but that's the vision is mm -hmm. to kind of skim off little bits that we learn as they come along mm -hmm. and uh, see how we could apply those to human medicine and hope that those will continue to be refined as we further understand mechanism in the hibernating animals. 
Um, so like for the, the um, muscle preservation, uh, we're hoping to look at the, some of the cellular pathways that um, sustain muscle growth and mm -hmm. then look at either uh, nutritional uh, um, signaling molecules, things that you can take in your diet that mm -hmm. activate those same pathways uh, or, you know, potentially a different um, ways to introduce uh, uh, genes or um, what are called uh, microRNA uh, that can um, affect those pathways. And so every time we understand a mechanism, we try to look at something that is tangible for human medicine that mm -hmm. we can uh, tweak that same mechanism for sure. therapeutic benefit. Yeah, it, it makes complete sense. I, I, I didn't want to throw all the science fiction stuff in there. I just know that obviously there's there's people that are very interested in this from, you know, where is, where is this going in 100 years from now because of... Yeah, well, my, my favorite thing stuff, is I, I've gotten to work with uh, Spaceworks Enterprises. Okay, cool. And they do have uh, some funding from NASA to mm -hmm. explore the concept. Right. So they're not actually doing experiments, but they're doing some simulated analyses to understand, uh, in, you know, like uh, savings for uh, payloads sure. and other cost savings. Um, and we have uh, gotten to talk to astronauts about the idea. They've everything from extremely invasive types of um, preparations of the astronauts, something like you might see in a in an ICU, okay. to very simple things like even just meditation mm -hmm. and how to enhance the the benefit of meditation for metabolic suppression. Wow! So it's uh, and maybe there's some. A uh, happy medium between those, where you could uh, enhance the effects of meditation pharmacologically with some of these drugs that we're using, um, and so it's it's really a lot of fun to think about that. Uh, and one of the things uh, that is probably most important is this thing called cabin fever, when mm -hmm. uh, astronauts are in these tiny little spaces for a long time with um, long-term space travel. I mean, the ability to go into a hibernation like state just makes the whole thing shorter sure. so uh you know that i think has significant benefits um, absolutely absolutely yeah that's fun i mean it's fun to think about this stuff but uh, at the same time every um, the short-term implications are, are are equal well it's interesting for nasa what they're caring most about right now is protection from um, ionizing radiation in space mm. so that's an extreme risk to the astronauts sure Sure. And cosmic, you know, radiation is uh, not even something that we can generate reliably here on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, there is some evidence that cooling uh, helps protect from the um, detrimental effects of radiation. Um, and that's something that needs further work. But, um, you know, and then if the, the whole muscle preservation, but muscle and um, bone preservation and anti-gravity is very much the same with as uh, disuse right. muscle atrophy mm -hmm. and bone loss and so those are also very important to nasa and so nice. we hope to uh continue um along those lines and right now uh nasa is not very interested really in um kind of some of the studies that are needed to move that further mm. forward it's mostly at the theoretical level that they they want to look into it more um but um but there is a lot of potential there and it, it it's very exciting and i i think a stepping stone to these applications for long-term space travel is for emergency medicine and um, more clinical settings and i think as we apply them there we're going to get better understanding of how it works and how to how to regulate side effects and really make it more sure. feasible to apply Absolutely. for long-term space travel Coming, coming back now to you, um, uh, uh, just a couple uh, more questions uh, to sort of the personal side of things. Um, and, and the first one is about mentors. Uh, obviously, you've had a, a chance to meet quite a few people over your career um, in, in various disciplines, scientific disciplines and so forth. Have there been specific people that have helped guide you on this path over the years that you might want to give a shout out to that, you know, if it wasn't for them, you would have gotten involved in cardiology or, or something totally different uh people that you know kept you on this particular path that were instrumental in well, i think all of my mentors have been 
instrumental. Um, uh, my PhD advisor was uh, Stan Glick. He was sure. a, a leading uh, neuropharmacologist, and uh, I think his, his, the strength for um, his mentoring style was he kind of let me do what I wanted to do. <laughs> so he was always there to answer questions. But and you know it's it, it kind of depends on the student. Um, but uh, I think that's really important to have that uh, luxury of being able to uh, follow your own path and. Um, your own inspiration and really be able to discover things because it's that sense of discovery that will really hook somebody on research. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's true also with my postdoc advisor. Um, he was Urban Ungerstedt at the Karolinska Institute. Okay. And, and he was also just like that, you know, he was always interested in what, uh, what we were learning, uh, but really let us um, ask the questions and, you know, guide the path. And he would, he would help when he was when he was needed and certainly share his enthusiasm and uh, some directions over others. But it was really that uh, that flexibility. And um, and then when I got back to Alaska, Sven Ebison uh, was absolutely wonderful in making space for me to be able to follow some of my own interests. And then Larry Duffy was always supportive and uh, helping me. Um, find resources uh, to, uh, you know, stay in science. Um, and then Brian Barnes is currently the director of my institute, and he okay. really is a, a leader in hibernation. And so he's just been wonderful to work with over the years. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a combination of uh, many people as well as colleagues and peers who have been supportive. Margaret Rice at New York University has always been a fantastic supporter. Um, she came up and worked with ground squirrels uh, with me for a bit. Now we have a couple of papers um, and it's, uh, it's just been, it's a great community in the scientific uh, area uh, that, you know, ultimately comes down to everybody's support of science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so it really is some, um, has been through federal support of research that gives us these uh, opportunities that is wonderful for the growth of uh, young people um, that ha get to have an opportunity to have this um, experience of discovery mm -hmm. and uh, to find out, you know, where their passion is. And if that happens to be it, then for opportunity to follow that. Sure. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm very uh, determined to see real medicines come from this. I think that those, uh, you know, public that supports it um, deserves to have uh, improved medicines come from it. And I hope that um, in my lifetime, we'll see that it saves lives. And I'm Absolutely. excited to have that opportunity to try to move it forward. Yeah, I, I'm sure it will. And, and uh, you know, going back to your, your bio in the beginning, I mean, the, the fact that you, you're putting Alaska on the map in, in, in this innovation context, and, you know, there's so many based on this discipline that you're leading the, uh, the, the charge for. There's just so many things, whether it be drugs, whether it be organ preservation technologies, whether it be more futuristic stuff, that are coming out of it. We're gonna come out of it and Alaska's gonna be yeah. on, on the map because well, of this. It's, and it's true, you know, because one thing in Alaska is that uh, there's a long history of studying hibernation for mm -hmm. good reason. One, we have, you know, we have extreme hibernators. We have extreme environment. Those animals have adapted to those uh, environments. The people who live there can appreciate <laughs> some of those some of those extremes. We all wish that we could hibernate too. Uh, it's a great way to get through the winter, um, and it's it's a resource I think that Alaska brings to the U.S. that uh, um, that we really do have uh, have opportunity to uh, discover things here, and um, and I I am really strongly committed to moving things forward in Alaska and uh, developing the economic um, diversity in the state and importantly creating opportunities for some of our uh, Alaska born residents, particularly Alaska native students um, that don't get exposure to science and they don't know, they don't even mm -hmm. know what's out there. And, right. and the most rewarding thing is to see a, a young person um, get excited by a new discovery. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't appreciate the creative aspect of the science. Mm. And it's just, uh, you know, it's art for the nerd. <laughs> so, you know, you, you know, you can create a masterpiece, a painting, and you understand, oh, yeah, that's creativity. But there are some people that don't have those visual 
talent, right. but they have this, you know, um, logical thinking right. and, uh, and they can discover things and it's really exciting. I'm sure I throwing the fro fro frozen uh, Arctic ground squirrels at them will get them excited as well. Yeah, right. That's why it's so fun to take it and show the kids. Yeah. And I, I wish I could uh, show people better through video. Um, but uh, yeah, there are there are a lot of YouTube and uh, you know um, different videos online that you can see the hibernation phenomenon. Yeah, we'll probably and many people have like... pet hamsters. Yeah. And uh, more, more and more people are learning not to bury their hamster if it becomes uh, inactive. They're mm. not really dead. <laughs> <laughs> You're not dead till you warm it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one final question while I have you, and then uh, I'll let you go because I, I know you have other things to do. Um, and, and this is take your time with this one. This is the question about uh, the person that Dr. Kelly Drew would have wanted to meet. Uh, it doesn't have to be a scientist. It could be a scientist, it could be an artist, philosopher, whomever. If you had the chance to go in my, my time machine that I have sitting in the other room here. Uh, for Dr. Kelly Drew, who might that person be and who would you want to have met uh, somewhere in history? Oh, that's a great question. Wow. Um, uh, there, there might be many, but I, I think I'm... You can you pick know, a my, few my, uh, have a dinner with them. Yeah. Well, my original training was in pharmacology, and I am, uh, I think it's those, um, um, those original pharmacologists that really in my lifetime uh, established the concept of receptors, mm. how receptors work, and uh, you know, how drugs work on receptors. And um, uh, Sir James Black was a famous mm. uh, pharmacologist sure. who received a Nobel Prize. Uh, for the discovery of receptors and the concept of receptors. And I, I think it's, uh, I guess, because of my training in pharmacology, it's that um, opportunity to influence our, our processes through drugs that can, you know, mimic uh, real life signaling um, and then to refine that. And that has all come from our understanding of receptors. Sure. So I, I think certainly one of my heroes is, uh, is Sir James Black. and uh, and and other, you know, neuroscientists, I did have an opportunity to meet uh, Julius Axelrod, who also received a Nobel Prize in, in neuroscience. And when I was at the Karolinska Institute, um, mm -hmm. some of the Nobel laureates uh, came through and uh, it was uh, it was great to meet him. I got to show him some of my data and talk about it. And sure. uh, that was uh, that was very exciting. Dr. Drew, it's, it's, it's been a, uh, a pleasure and honor to uh, have had you spend the time with us today to talk about everything you're doing, as we say, you know, moving the human story forward, um, and, and you know, really going to be keeping an eye on on, on all that you're doing and, and wishing you the best of luck with it. Uh, for everybody that is going to be listening uh, on the radio or watching, uh, we've been spending time with Dr. Kelly Drew from the Institute of Art of Biology at the University of Alaska, doing truly amazing things in, in critical care and organ preservation. Um, keep an eye on this because it is clearly a uh, and really an untapped area of, of biology that is going to have such importance uh, for in its human translation. And um, Dr. Just, just thank you for doing it <laughs> and, and being oh, well, there thank you. For, for leading this forward. It's, it's really amazing. Thank you, for the, thank you for the work that you do. I really appreciate uh, Try to get the work taking out. the time the and helping out. us communicate uh, the value of what we do and the value of science to the community Absolutely. and to the public. Absolutely. All it's right. so nice well, meeting thank you. Thank you so much.